Hi everyone, this week we are going to go over the very big topic of taxation. In fact, I will cover this topic over two different um, lectures. So, let's get into it. First, the disclaimer. I do not allow this content to be published without my consent. If I see this content online, I will take it down and report whoever posted it. So why do governments tax? Or rather, I would say, what do they um, tax people for? So they use taxes to exercise what we call regalian functions. Regalian functions are, well, regalian comes from the word um, re or roi in French, so king, which used to be the function that had to be um, taken care of by, um, by the government or by the kingdom. Functions such as justice, defense and security, fire departments, and so on. Other, uh, other views um, look at regalian functions as, um, such as um, education, health, and so on. But if you look at other countries, at some countries, the healthcare system or the education system are uh, mostly, if not fully, privately funded. Fund infrastructure. Governments are the ones who are building roads, building bridges, maintaining, uh, maintaining the railroad um, network, and so on. They are the ones sometimes building schools, for public schools, or building hospitals, and so on. They also fund public goods, like, um, like lakes. They take care of beaches. They introduce um, green spaces in um, urban areas, and so on. And finally, governments use tax, uh, taxes, or in particular tax revenue, to operate redistribution in the form of major transfers to persons. As we saw in the first lecture, perfectly competitive markets are Pareto efficient. So, in terms of pure efficiency, the government should not have to intervene whatsoever. However, it doesn't mean that this is the only Pareto efficient allocation. In fact, there are many different Pareto efficient allocations. Once we, wait, once we get to one of them, we cannot make somebody better off without making somebody else worse off. But we can go from one Pareto efficient allocation to another. That might mean somebody might be made worse off in the, in the process. But in this new Pareto efficient allocation, again, Nobody can be made better off without somebody uh, made worse off. And so, once we can reach different Pareto efficient allocations, now the new question becomes, what Pareto efficient allocation is better? Redistribution can help reach other Pareto efficient allocations that might be preferable, usually based on some equity criteria. Imagine the Pareto efficient allocation where one person in the country owns everything and nobody else owns nothing. That would be one allocation. Another Pareto efficient allocation could be where all the resources are used and the income distribution is rather equal. Not necessarily exactly equal, but people roughly have the same amount of resources. Well, Governments might prefer one allocation over the other, in this case, probably the second allocation over the first, because it is more fair. Redistribution can help reach another Pareto efficient allocation that might uh, be less unequal. Just to give you a rough idea about um, tax revenue for the Canadian government, for the year 2018-2019, the federal government tax revenues represent 280 billion, uh, well, thousands of billions, I would say, over 332, which represents around 84% of the total government revenue. I suggest you to look at um, the following link. 
that is going to show you a breakdown of um, tax revenues and um, budget expenses for the year 2018-2019. Every year, many governments, in particular the Canadian government, publish a report of how much revenue they gathered the previous year and how they are going to use this revenue um, by spending some money on public goods, like roads, healthcare system, and so on, paying public sector employees, um, and various other forms of expenses. I suggest you take a look at, that, at this um, link to get an idea of what the main revenue is, what the main tax revenue is, and what are the major expenses. So, the outline for these two lectures. First, I'm going to talk about measuring inequalities, and I will in particular talk about the Lorentz curve and the Gini coefficient. Then I'll get into types and forms of taxation. I will also show you a simple model with a quantity tax. I will define what a quantity tax is in the types and forms of taxation. And I will look at this model in order to look at the impact of a tax on the market equilibrium and to get into what we call tax incidence. Who actually bears the burden of the tax? It is more complicated than just saying, oh, I am imposing a tax on consumers, so consumers are paying the tax. They are effectively paying the tax, but they are not the ones carrying the burden of the tax necessarily. Then I will also talk about a labor tax as a um, throwback to the labor economics lecture. I will look at the impact of a labor tax on labor supply decisions. Then in the second lecture, I will get into the Laffer curve, which is a curve that describes how much taxation is too much taxation. Then I'll talk about progressivity, regressivity and neutrality of a tax system. And then I'll get into the um, probably the most important form of taxation. One, because it is the major revenue for the Canadian government and for many governments. And second, because this is the tax that everybody is subject to. So I'll talk about the income tax and I'll talk about the earned income tax credit program, EITC, um, as a way to decrease income inequalities. So let's get into measuring inequalities. In order to measure inequalities, we have a bunch of different tools and measures available. None of them is perfect, which is why we look at all of them uh, in general to look for um, differences or maybe to see if um, some patterns are going to appear. The main one is called the Lorentz curve. It is a graph that represents the proportion of overall income or wealth assumed by the bottom X percent of the people. The same way we were looking at wage inequalities um, in the labor economics lecture, we were looking at the bottom X percent of the people earning a um, certain wage. Here, we are going to look at the share of total income, the X poorest uh, people, X percent poorest people um, earn. So in order to draw this curve, first of all, rank the households in increasing order of income. So if you have your file of data in a spreadsheet, sort your data in order or in increasing order of income so that the first lines are going to be the lowest incomes and the last lines will be the highest incomes. Then look for the first 10% of these households. Let's say that you have 200 household data points, then you will look at the 21st households. They are the poorest because their income has been ranked and they represent 20% of the population because 20 out of 200 is equal to um, 
Then you accumulate their income, you add up their income, and you divide this income by the total income of all the households. And then you repeat the same process for the first 20%, 30% poorest, 40% poorest, until you get to 100% poorest. Sorry. So on the graph, on the X axis, you're going to represent the percent of the population. And on the Y axis, you're going to represent the percentage of the total income these um, people earn. For instance, if I have 10%, the 10% poorest people on the blue curve here will earn around a very small number, something like 0. Point, maybe 1% of the total income. And then you report the numbers for 20%, 30%, 50%, and so on. The blue curve is what we call the Lorenz curve. For instance, here at the point of 70% of the population, since I looked at the 70% poorest people, the share of their total income ends up being 24.01% of the total income. When I look at 0% of the total population, of course, they earn 0% of the total income. Same with 100%. 100% of the people earn 100% of the total income. Now, I want to draw your attention on this diagonal black line here. This is what we call the 45 degree line. On this line, any x coordinate is equal to the corresponding y coordinate. So at 70, I have 70. This represents a perfectly equal income distribution. This means here that the 70% poorest people earn 70% of the total income. Well, in this case, we cannot really call them the poorest because they earn exactly the same share as the share of the population they represent. At 50, it would be 50 as well. At 20, it would be 20 as well. So this is a perfectly equal distribution where each person earns exactly the same uh, amount of money as the others. Then, how far the Lorentz curve is from this 45 degree line will tell you how unequal the income distribution is. So the further the Lorentz curve from the 45 degree line, the more income inequality there is. Thus, you can look at the Lorentz curve for the same country over two, three, or multiple years and see how the income distribution has evolved over time. Or you could also compare the Lorentz curve of two different countries on the same year to compare the income distribution in each. However, if you want to judge income inequality here, you can only judge by looking at the distance between the Lorentz curve and the 45 degree line. But some Lorentz curves might be closer in the first part to the 45 degree line and then get further. In this case, it is hard to compare two different Lorentz curves. Ideally, we would have access to a number, some kind of a quantitative measure, to compare two income distributions. The Gini coefficient will fulfill that role. It is the blue area between the 45 degree line and the Lorentz curve. It can be mathematically computed. It is always between 0 and 1. And the, the smaller it is, the smaller this area is, which means the closer the Lorentz curve 
is to the 45 degree line. So when the Gini coefficient is small, then it means that the income distribution is rather equal, not very unequal. On the other hand, if the area is equal to one, then it is the same as having a Lorentz curve that stretches all the way horizontally here and then suddenly spikes up vertically. That would correspond to a distribution where 99.9999999% of the population earns 0% of the total income. And then suddenly that last person, that 0.0000001% earns 100% of the income. And so the Lorentz curve would have a kink here at 100. In this case, the distribution would be extremely unequal. In fact, the most unequal. And the Gini coefficient would be equal to 1. A Gini coefficient of 0 and 1, of course, are extreme cases, and they do not happen in reality. But we can compare the Gini coefficient of different countries or of for the same country over different years to look at overall how income inequalities are. Note that as I said, sometimes the Lorentz curve could go inside here and then outside. And the Gini coefficient could still be kind of the same. In this case, it would require more careful inspection of where inequalities have decreased and where they have increased. If the Lorentz curve, the new Lorentz curve is closer to the 45 degree line on the left part of the graph, until 70, let's say, then it means that in that area, the income distribution has improved. It is more equal. But if it's outwards here, then it means that it's more unequal in the richest parts of the population. Any questions? Okay. Now let's get into a taxonomy. They are very, very different types of taxes. Let's go over them. The one you probably know the most is maybe apart from income tax are going to be commodity taxes. Those are taxes that apply to goods and services. We distinguish two commodity taxes. Value added tax, the VAT, is a tax that um, applies at every stage of the production process. The GST and the PST in Canada are examples of VAT taxes. What do I mean by every stage of the production process? Well, when you buy a coffee from Tim Hortons, you pay GST and PST. Your receipt shows how much tax you paid out of the price. When Tim Hortons buys their coffee from, let's say, a Colombian torrefactor, then they are also going to pay a value added tax. Because of this, because there will be the customer in that transaction. We then distinguish value added tax from sales tax. A sales tax is a tax on a selected list of goods and services intended for final consumption, not on inputs. So that's a tax that will only happen when a consumer buys a good for final consumption. It doesn't apply to many goods anymore. It can be charged at the manufacturer level, like the old Canadian sale tax, or at the time of consumption, like the BC sales tax. The next type of tax you probably know the best is going to be income tax. We distinguish personal income taxes and, personal, uh, and corporate income taxes. Personal income tax is a tax based on your income. Every year, you have to report what your income was, your 
um, firm will issue a form that you can then upload online and you can fill some, um, you can use the numbers from your form to fill online forms. And based on those numbers, the government will compute how much um, income tax you owe. Corporate income tax will be a tax that applies not on individuals' incomes, but rather on firms' income, which are profits. Profits are computed after a long series of computations involving first paying employees, um, paying for intermediary products, paying for interest at the banks, and so on and so forth. Once we obtain gross profits, the firm has to pay corporate income tax, after which she will get um, after-tax profits, which she can use to um, save, invest, redistribute to the shareholders, and so on. Probably the third type of tax that um, you know the best might not have applied to all of you guys yet, but it will at some point. Payroll tax. It is a tax on wages. It is paid often by both employees and employers and are mainly used to finance employment insurance. Something such as if you're unemployed, um, if you are pregnant, if you are sick and so on and so forth. Pension plans for retirement and healthcare programs. If you look at, if you work and you look at your pay slip, you can see that some, somewhere at some point there will be a section called payroll tax or tax deductions. One of them is called employment insurance in Canada. The other one I believe is called CPP for Canadian pension plan and maybe a couple more. And you can take a look at how much these taxes amount to. Last type of tax that will maybe apply to uh, some of you, but maybe not all of you, even in your lifetime, at least I'm not sure it's going to apply to me ever. Property taxes. Those are taxes on the value of an asset, which are in general a house a property or some land. Probably you haven't been subjected to property taxes yet. But this is something you will have to pay once you um, invest in some housing, once you buy a piece of land or if you buy a house or um, an apartment. Now, all of these taxes can come in two forms. They can either be an ad valorem tax. Ad valorem is a Latin um, expression that stands for according to value. Such a tax is based on the value of the good, service, personal property, or income. So the amount of the tax that you will have to pay depends on the value of what you own or what you buy. It is usually expressed in percentage terms. Personal income tax is an ad valorem tax. GST, general sales tax, and employment insurance contributions are going to be Ad valorem taxes as well. If you buy $100 of groceries, you won't pay the same amount of taxes as if you buy for $50 worth of groceries because the percentage applies to a different amount. As opposed to a percentage tax, an ad valorem tax, we distinguish a per unit tax or a quantity tax. It is a specific duty, that is a, which is a tax based on the quantity of an item, regardless of the price. So usually it is expressed in monetary terms. For instance, an excise tax, which is a tax on specific goods, in particular gasoline, tobacco, alcohol, are quantity taxes. They are not expressed as a percentage of the price, but rather as an amount of dollars per unit, something as an amount of dollars per gasoline or per liter of gasoline or an amount of dollars per liter of alcohol or an amount of dollar per pound of tobacco. 
For instance, just to give you an idea, I have in front of me some, um, some numbers regarding some excise taxes. Let me take a look. Where are they? Mm -hmm. No, they might be here. Cannabis, for instance, is subject to an ad valorem tax and a flat rate cannabis duty, like an excise tax. For instance, flowering material is taxed at 25 cents per gram or at 2.5% of the amount for the cannabis product, whichever is um, the highest. Alcohol is also taxed. Where is alcohol? Alcohol, alcohol. Alcohol is taxed at $3,400 um, per hectoliter of beer, containing more than 2.5% of absolute ethyl um, alcohol by volume. So the excise duty will change according to the percentage of alcohol in the beverage. 3,400 per hectoliter represents um, Oh, sorry. Or maybe three dollars, three dollars and four hundred cents. Sorry. Um, so if you divide this by a hundred, you would get the excise duty per liter of beer, and so on. Tobacco is taxed at um, seventy-two cents per five cigarettes, or fraction of five cigarettes contained in any package. So for a um, so you can multiply this by four to get the amount of excise tax per pack of cigarettes. Tobacco sticks per stick um, are taxed at 14 cents. Manufactured tobacco other than cigarettes and tobacco sticks are charged at $9 per 50 grams and so on. Raw leaf as well and there is a bunch. Now, I want to go over a model, um, an economic theory model of taxation to look at the impact of a tax on a market outcome. Let's take the example of a quantity tax. It is easier to analyze than an ad valorem tax, graphically easier, and the intuition is pretty much the same. Consider a perfectly competitive market and assume that a quantity tax of T dollars is imposed on consumers. So every time a consumer wants to purchase one unit of the good, the consumer has to pay T dollars on top of the price, and those T dollars will be collected by the government, by the firm, and the firm will pay them back to the government um, later. So remember the demand curve, the inverse demand curves represents the price consumers are willing to pay for the corresponding nth unit of the good, the qth unit of the good. If consumers are willing to pay P dollars for one unit of the good, then after being taxed, they will only be willing to pay P minus T dollars for the good. Why? Because they will pay P minus T to the, to the firm, and on top of that, they will pay T to the government. Of course, in terms of bookkeeping, consumers, the consumer will not tell the difference. He will pay a total amount of P dollars to the firm, but P minus T will be kept by the firm and T dollars will be paid back to the government. So for the good itself, the consumer is willing to pay P minus T dollars now. This means that the demand is going to shift down. For each unit, maybe the consumer was willing to pay $10 for a unit before. 
Now, he might be willing to pay only $8 because he knows he's going to have to pay two extra dollars on top in the form of a quantity tax. The supply, however, is unchanged because the firm is just collecting the tax paid by the consumer. On this graph, we have the original market equilibrium before the tax. Supply is equal to demand. The equilibrium price and quantities are P star and Q star. The blue area will be the consumer surplus. The, the red area will be the producer surplus. After a tax is imposed on consumers, the demand is going to shift down. So the vertical space between the two curves represents the tax, T. The new market equilibrium will then be where the supply, which hasn't changed, meets the new demand P prime D. The corresponding price will be P prime and the quantity will be Q prime. Now, this price is the price on the market. So this is the price that the firm is going to receive. But this is not the price that consumers are going to pay. Consumers will pay that price to the firm plus an amount T to the government. So this is the amount that consumers will end up paying overall between the government and the firm. You can see now that both surpluses have decreased. The consumer surplus used to go all the way down to P star and all the way to the right to Q star. It, ha it has reduced due to a lower quantity and a higher price. The producer surplus has decreased as well due to a lower quantity and a lower price that it's going to receive. So, so far, there are big losses. Nobody is better off here. However, we need to take into account the fact that this tax will constitute a revenue for the government. So, we can now include tax revenue as an additional surplus. The yellow area corresponds to the tax here, vertical, um, vertical length, times the quantity sold, horizontal length. This will constitute the government revenue. Note that if I add these three surpluses together, I am not equal to what I had before the tax. I am left here with a triangle that used to be consumer surplus here and producer surplus. Now, nobody is getting this surplus anymore. It's a deadweight loss. The same way a monopoly and externalities are going to lead to a market failure, government intervention leads to a non-efficient price and quantity on the market. But you can look at it as a necessary evil because the government needs some revenue in order to fund infrastructures, operate regalian functions and operate redistribution. Now, note that the price has decreased from P star to P prime, but the price is not lower by the amount T. It has decreased a bit, but not by the full amount T. So who is actually paying the tax? This is what tax incidence is about. It is the analysis of the tax burden. Imposing the tax on consumers does not mean that consumers pay the previous equilibrium price plus the tax. If you look here, the price consumers pay is not equal to P star plus T. It is equal to P prime plus T. But P prime is lower than P star. 
So compared to the no tax case, they don't pay the full amount of the tax. They only pay this part. The tax burden is carried by both the consumers and the producers, although the tax is imposed on consumers in the first place. In order to analyze the incidence of um, the tax, we will need to consider elasticities. They are going to be very useful for two reasons. First, they will determine the new equilibrium quantity and price, and thus they will um, tell us about the government revenue. Second, the relative elasticities of supply versus demand will determine how much consumers and producers pay off the tax. In order to look at this, let's look at the same graph as before, but now the demand is steeper than the supply. The equilibrium price before the tax is still P star Q star. And imagine that I am imposing a tax on consumers, same as before. The new equilibrium will be at P prime Q prime. But now note that out of the government revenue, the upper rectangle, the rectangle above P star, is bigger than the lower rectangle between P star and P prime. The reason is that P prime decreased because of the tax, but not that much. When you add this big tax, then consumers end up paying a way higher price as opposed to the price that now firms are going to receive. So what happens here is that consumers are paying a higher fraction of the tax because their demand is more inelastic or is less elastic. Note that the firms are still paying a small portion of the tax because their surplus is reduced. The new sale price is lower than P star, so their surplus has decreased. But when adding the tax, you can see that the difference between the price paid by consumers and P star is bigger than the difference between the price between P star and the price received by firms. Here, consumers are paying a higher fraction of the tax because the price has not decreased that much. The price has not decreased that much because the demand is inelastic. Note as well that consumers are the ones who lost, who lost most of the surplus. This trapezoid is way bigger than this one. And it is all because this demand is steeper than this supply. So consumers pay for most of the tax because demand is more inelastic than supply. This is a very interesting result. It means that it doesn't matter who the tax is imposed on. Whether you impose on consumers or producers, doesn't matter. At the end of the day, what's going to matter are the relative magnitudes of elasticities between supply and demand. In tutorial, I show the exact same graph but instead, the tax is imposed on suppliers, on the firms. The tax is equal, is equal to the same amount. So instead of shifting the demand down, we shift the supply up. And the new equilibrium price ends up being here. That's the price that consumers pay, still the same as now. And the price that firms are going to receive is that price minus the tax. And the different surpluses will exactly be the same. But the tax is now imposed on producers. The only reason why maybe a government would pay attention to whether the tax is imposed on consumers or producers 
is just a PR um, issue. If they want to look good to the population, they might say that they're going to tax firms. But at the end of the day, consumers will also end up paying some part of the tax. But this means that we don't need to care about who is going to pay the tax accounting wise in terms of bookkeeping. What matters, again, is the difference between elasticities between the supply and the demand. Now, let's go over a second example. Now, I'm going to take the example of an ad valorem tax, in particular on labor supply. So consider the optimal labor supply decision for a consumer, as we saw in the lecture on labor economics. Remember, we had a budget constraint, an indifference curve, and a tangency point. Now, imagine that there's a payroll tax of T% that is imposed on the worker. So one hour of work doesn't earn W dollars, the wage, but rather it earns one minus T times W. What's gonna happen here is the budget line is not going to shift, but rather it is going to pivot. Now let's look at the impact of this tax on somebody who works and on somebody who doesn't work. This graph is the before tax graph. We have a budget set where any point below and on the budget line is an affordable bundle for our agent. Any point beyond is not affordable. It is a combination of consumption and leisure that is not affordable. So our agent will look for the highest possible indifference curve. By highest, we mean the most northeast indifference curve that is still affordable. The highest will touch the budget line, the boundary, at only one point, a tangency point. That will determine L star and C star the optimal leisure and consumption bundle for our agent. Now, if a tax of T% percent is imposed on the wage, the budget line is going to shrink, but not vertically, it is going to pivot. Why? Well, imagine the case where our agent does not work at all. If he doesn't work at all, he can afford the same amount of consumption as before, I over P. He doesn't perceive any wage, so there should not be any shift. As the amount of hours worked increases, or as leisure decreases, the agent then will have um, access to less income in order to consume. The budget set is now delimited by the orange line. Any bundle in between is not affordable anymore. It used to be under the no tax regime, but now it is not affordable anymore. So our agent cannot reach this blue indifference curve anymore. He needs to adjust and find another indifference curve that is going to be affordable. Well, it's going to look for the highest indifference curve again that touches the budget set. It will touch the budget line in particular. At this point, another tangency point that will give him the new optimal bundle L star, uh, L prime, C prime. Now, note that the level of consumption has decreased and the amount of leisure has increased. We have two effects to explain this change. First of all, 
The substitution effect says that leisure is relatively more valuable than consumption because leisure now is relatively cheaper. Remember that the wage is the opportunity cost of leisure and that's what we call the price of leisure. If before I was making $40 an hour, now because of the tax I am making let's say $30, so there is a 25% tax in the middle, then now taking an hour off is not as bad because instead of giving up on $40, I am giving up on $30. Thus, leisure becomes relatively cheap, relatively, as opposed to consumption, which price hasn't changed. So, the consumer, the agent, will take more leisure and less consumption. Leisure will increase and consumption will decrease. But that's not all. There is a second effect. The second effect is the income effect. The agent is earning less money overall. Even if he was working the same amount, he would earn less money because of the tax. So, both leisure and consumption will decrease. Imagine that leisure is the same as a good another consumption good. If you are poor overall, you will take less of it. If you take less leisure, it means that you are working more. Now, let's compare these two effects. In both effects, consumption is going to decrease. In the substitution case, because it is because leisure is cheaper than consumption, relatively, so we consume less and take more time off. And the second effect, the income effect, is because we are poor overall. So we cannot afford as much as we used to. For leisure, however, the effects go in opposite directions. The substitution effect makes the agent take more time off, work less. The income effect, effect makes him work more. So the net effect on leisure is ambiguous. It depends on preferences, on the shape of the indifference curve, on the utility function. Here, the graph is such that the substitution effect, increase in leisure, dominates the income effect, decrease in leisure, because at the end of the day, the agent works less. But it could also be that the effects cancel each other exactly, in which case the leisure decision will not change. And it could also be that the income effect dominates, and so the, um, the new leisure decision is lower. The agent decides to work more. But both of these effects show that consumption is going to decrease no matter what, and this is what we see. And this is something we will see every time. Now, this is for somebody who works already. What about people who do not work? Will the tax make them change their mind? Well, think about it. Somebody who doesn't work is not working because the market wage, the money he can make by working, is not high enough compared to his reservation wage. And now you tell this person that the wage that shows on the uh, job offer is not even the wage he's going to receive per hour because there's going to be a tax on it. So the market wage after tax is even lower than uh, before. And the before tax wage was not even high enough to get that person to work. So somebody who doesn't work will still not work. Now, whether overall there is going to be more or less employment will depend on the aggregation of all of these responses.
I'm going to stop here for the first part on taxation. Have a good rest of your week and see you in the next one. Bye.